Okay, hello everybody, and thanks for joining us. For those of you who are on the live uh, Zoom link, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. I know I always say that, but uh, I'm always uh, a little bit concerned that I'm not uh, always being heard. But uh, if not, let me know, and I'm more than glad to uh, uh, to try to fix uh, something. But it appears like uh, this setup here is working pretty well for us. Uh, it's not the best camera angle, I know. It's kind of been a weird uh, kind of slant. There's really nothing we can do about that. I have tried. <laughs> so um, anyway, today what I want to do is this. I, I, I began uh, on uh, Monday talking about Chapter 7, which, uh, as, I, as I mentioned to the class on Monday, really is one of the critical chapters in the text. It, it may be the most important of the chapters. Uh, I know that Chapter 5, I said, was also important, and it is. But, but Chapter 5 was important in sort of a different way because it talked about elasticity, which is not exactly uh, in most people's wheelhouse. You know, easily live your entire life and never heard the word elasticity in the context of demand and supply and, and income and substitutes and complements and all that. But these are concepts which are critical really to understanding economics, particularly microeconomics. But then micro itself has got great applicability to, to a lot of the courses, which for those of you who are, are business students uh, will be seeing again. There's no question about it. Things like fixed and variable costs uh, will come up again. You'll be seeing them again and again and again. And I, I realize, and I think I have said this before, that, that I know that the majority of the people who take micro principles and macro principles are looking to, to probably go on to get a, a four-year degree in, in business. Um, that's not everyone, and nor do I assume that that's the vast majority. I, I think it is the majority, but it's not. Uh, we don't tailor the, the course necessarily for that, but it certainly is, we're mindful of it because of the fact that we know that that's a large segment of uh, the student uh, uh, enrollment that are taking these courses. These are concepts which will come up again. So I've long thought that micro has great applicability to what comes up a bit later. So don't forget these. You may forget some of these formulas that I'll give you here, but uh, don't don't uh, lose the idea of what a fixed cost is, what a variable cost is, what, a, what a, you know, all those kinds of things. And we're gonna talk more in depth about these. I've given you sort of a cheat sheet here uh, that I'd like, if you can see it, Maybe try to write these down. And if those of you who are watching the uh, the video may, may want to pause everything just to sort of uh, capture it and write these down. These are pretty much all the formulas that you would need to know in order to understand the concepts which are addressed in chapter seven. Okay. And some of these we haven't really gotten into yet at all, such as these guys here average variable cost, average fixed cost, uh, marginal cost. We will do that. Uh, we'll get to that today. Also, in talking about the schedule here, I had. Uh, when I had planned the syllabus, I had put chapter eight in the uh, conversation for next week. And I'm, I'm not even going to attempt to, to get to chapter eight. And in, in a lot of ways, it probably doesn't even make sense to do so. Uh, I'm not even sure that I'm going to get through all of chapter seven today. There's a lot going on there. It's a fairly deep chapter. I've got some uh, examples that I'm going to bring into the discussion today. So chapter eight will not be part of the exam, so, uh, which is next week. So what we'll do on Tuesday, or Monday, I'm sorry, is... We will cover some material, and I, I, I'm probably only going to talk about the, the remaining bit of Chapter 7 that I'm able to get to uh, on, on uh, Monday. I hope that I get to the sort of long-run dimension on this, which actually doesn't take all that long to cover, but it is important. Uh, and then we'll spend the bulk of the time, the balance of the hour and 15 minutes, talking about the exam, uh, which is set for next week. It'll be available right after class on Wednesday, and it'll be available... Uh, in Brightspace through the end of the day, Sunday, that is 11.59 p.m. Also, if you want to take it in class, feel free to do that as well. Uh, I will be here. You can do that if you'd like. So either of those options, or you can also choose the option of coming into one of our testing centers. Um, main campus is a, is, a, is a pretty good testing center, and I... I uh, I'm not sure where the other testing centers are even located. I think they moved them around at both West Side and Montoya uh, since I've been there. I haven't actually taught at either one of those campuses in several years. I've been here in Maine uh, really the whole time. So, but I have taught there before and I'm somewhat familiar, even though they got new buildings. That's how long it's been since I've been there. But nonetheless, I can sit you up if that is what your preference is. No question about it. Some people would like to have it because maybe your home situation isn't uh, conducive to taking the exam. I understand, <laughs> you know, uh, having children, you know, and, and running around. I don't think I'd want to take my exam at home, but a lot of people would. And if you prefer that, feel free to do that. I have no preference one way or the other. You can take one of three ways uh, in bright space, wherever you choose, sitting at Starbucks or wherever, uh, or uh, you 
and taking in class on Wednesday or at the testing center sometime next week. Okay, so uh, it's the same setup as last time. So anyway, I'm gonna, so take a look at this, and uh, I know that we haven't gotten through all these yet, but you know, it occurred to me that I, I don't think we have these in our online textbook in a, in a format that is sort of all together, and I, I think it's important to have these. Notably, this issue of, of total product, I, I just started to talk about this on Monday. Total product, which I said is also synonymous with Q, it's not quite Q, because the Q that we know is quantity exchanged in a market. That's not really what this is. This is total produced, but it's fairly similar to Q. And, and, and if you were to look at other textbooks, maybe, or to pull up other websites, and students often do this, and I think it's fine to, to do you know, Khan Academy online has got lots of good resources uh, for, for econ in particular, econ and finance, if, you, if you're into to, to looking at that. And sometimes they may use Q. I can't recall if they do or not, but I'm just saying there are economists that will just simply use the term, the letter Q. But total product is what's used in your text. And so I, and I kind of prefer that anyway, because it does differentiate the fact that this is amount produced, the total amount produced in a given time period by some production unit, whatever that is, whether it's one shift, whether it's one plant, whether it's one company, for whatever period of time, week, a day, a month, whatever, okay? <clears throat> so, and as long as we're capturing apples and apples, that is total production and the total cost of one day, in one day, so I mean, it's gotta be apples and apples here, uh, then we're able to make meaningful judgments about what's going on. So take a look at these. Uh, accounting profit is where we left off last time. Uh, well, specifically economic profit. And what did we say about um, accounting profit versus economic profit? And again, the pi symbol here is simply our notational uh, shorthand for the word profit. We're fond of using Greek letters in economics. Uh, so are people in the sciences everywhere. Um, <laughs> the Greek letters are very, I don't know, uh, much in vogue, but uh, have been for a long time. But it's the symbol for profit is simply that of total revenue minus total cost. In whatever kind of conception you're looking at, the difference is that we depart from our accounting cousins in the sense that in the accounting world, in the financial world, total cost is only explicit costs. We defined explicit costs a bit earlier in the class by saying these are true accounting costs defined as those costs which are objectively determined that two people are going to probably arrive at the same figures and that they're objective, they're measurable, and they're verifiable. We've got a way to go back and, and see whether or not those costs were right. So if somebody says, hey, production costs for the week of ending March 12th are really out of whack. Let's go look at it. And that, you know, an objective look should give you the same figure. Implicit costs, however, those opportunity costs, where if we're applying it to a specific instance, we're saying it's the best, it's the, it's the cost of the best foregone alternative that we did not do. I know that's a little bit abstract, and the accounting world is aware of this. And in fact, sometimes there are costs which are so nebulous that uh, it, it notes to financial statements that are at the bottom or usually at the end of a financial statement, it'll say this particular cost we're recognizing as an accounting cost, but it's very it's fairly nebulous. Uh, it was the the uh, uh, we shut down a plant in Akron, uh, you know, and uh, we had the opportunity to have created X amount of revenue, and uh, you know that sort of thing. It's really an, an, an opportunity cost, and maybe they don't even call it an accounting cost. Maybe they just call it an opportunity cost, but they want the reader to know that it's there and that they're aware of it but maybe the accounting conventions don't uh, allow them to, to record that. Economists, however, are not bound by any such uh, restrictions. We don't have investors and lenders that we're seeking to uh, create standardized information for. So we do count the value of implicit costs. Again, the value of the best for our opportunity. So what does this mean? If, if there's another layer of cost here, what we can say is this, <clears throat> that economic profit is always going to be less than accounting profit. Okay, so what about economic profit? Economic profit, because it's less than accounting profit, economic profit may, oops, that's a pie symbol. Economic profit may be zero, right? Or it may be negative. It may actually be negative. And I know that in my online course, that is strictly just online, and all the activities are done online, uh, we, we have an activity where we, we talk about why would a firm want to operate with a negative economic profit? And the answer to that is maybe accounting profit is actually positive. So uh, all of their expenses are being paid, all, all the workers are being paid, all the suppliers are being paid, lenders and creditors are, are satisfied, uh, but they still may operate because of the fact that uh, 
uh, and they're, all, they're just being satisfied, even though they may not be earning the most economic. And so why economic profit is important from our standpoint as economists is the idea that, that we're seeking to optimize the performance of the firm given the, the objective of the firm. Remember now, we are in this segment of the class in which we're talking about the economics of the firm. And we said that all economic actors are seeking to maximize benefit. It goes to what we call maximizing behavior. And so what is the maximizing behavior of business firms? The benefit is to maximize profit. And can profit not be, and it's economic profit specifically. And can we not maximize it by avoiding that which we do less well and do that by which we do uh, better and uh, realize that we can't do it all. And I think that we are at a stage in industrial development where firms are recognizing that they cannot do it all. Not that they didn't know that before, not that this is some grand revelation, what I'm saying is there is a trend in the business world now where firms are actually making themselves smaller or more limited in scope. It's what we call economies of scope. We'll come back to that topic a bit later. But that's the idea that they can't do everything. And so they'd rather do fewer things better than do more things and, and generate more, more businesses. And we're seeing, we're seeing companies split themselves up and, and spin themselves off. So, um, you know, Abbott Labs and spin off its research unit and call that AbbV. Um, we're seeing all kinds of companies uh, split themselves up into various parts and uh, and spin them off in separate companies, sometimes with all, holding a bit of ownership themselves. Uh, but it's this idea of focus and that have, having people focus on fewer things rather than more because we can't do it all. There's a recognition that we're going to have to give up something in order to do something. And, and the great industrialist Andrew Carnegie, uh, who founded uh, United States Steel, was of the opinion and you can only do one thing very, very well. Now, I don't know if I would go quite so far as to agree with that, but uh, then again, he became one of the world's first billionaires. And he said, you can't, he goes, not only can you not do a lot of things, you can, you can only really do one thing very, very well. So Alex Rodriguez plays baseball very, very well. He may not be the best sports commentator in the world. Uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. I don't, you know, I mean, I don't like truly agree with Carnegie. And I don't even know, know that I agree that Alex Rodriguez could not do anything other than baseball. I'm just simply saying that's one point of view, and that's a fairly old point of view, uh, which I think was not widely accepted at the time that he said it about more than 100 years ago. But I think now that uh, business is recognized and that focus uh, makes a difference and makes an important difference. So these are the things that we ought to know about. So where do we end up last time talking about economic profit and accounting profit? What are the differences between those? Let's talk a bit about um, if you go, if you're in looking at the slide package that I had provided before, um, we talked about this idea of the three kinds of values in economics. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Hopefully, everyone's had a chance to look at this. And if not, you can always pull up the, the YouTube video. Uh, what are the three kinds of values in economics? And I'm not going to write them here because uh, they're, they're there for you. We've talked about them before totals, averages, and marginals. And I talked a bit last time about what the problems are with averages. That is the idea that, that the, whatever the average value is for a set of observations may not be representative of any individual value whatsoever, particularly if the data is widely dispersed. You may end up with some value that doesn't make any sense at all, like you know, household size of 1.7 children, right? That, it's that sort of thing. It's not there is no it, there is no household of 1.7 children. So what does that average even mean? Because you can't even point to a representative household uh, uh, that would be your, your exemplar for that. Or it could be that extreme values generally are throwing off averages. So average values are a bit misleading. And I, I sort of want to put average in its place here because what is more important from our standpoint in economics are marginal values. Marginal values are incremental. So that is, as we go from one level to the next, this is a critical bit of understanding. And it's not one that I think is as easily understood as totals and averages, uh, frankly. In fact, I will admit that when I was a young econ student, uh, I had a little bit of trouble understanding this idea of marginals. And it's the idea of incrementals. That is, and it's really where we live, right? It's it's the idea that if it, since we're talking about the economics of the firm here, it's where the firm lives right now. If you're a manufacturer of refrigerators and you produce two million refrigerators per year, next year you're not going to probably produce 20 million refrigerators. You might produce two million fifty thousand refrigerators. Or two point or two million one hundred thousand refrigerators. It's incremental. It's not some gigantic change in the situation here. Uh, you're you're moving up the, the chain. You're you're moving up along what is a reasonable 
step and, uh, and, and doubling or tripling the F in one year is, is usually not possible. I'm not saying it never happens, uh, but absent you know, some takeover by another company or some kind of combination or just something really crazy going on in the demand side, it's just really not possible. And by the way, demand oftentimes it does drive supply decisions. Whatever the demand side is wanting, the supply side will oftentimes be responsible uh, for. And so when we talk about production, we talk about incrementals, we need to differentiate these two terms here, total product, which is basically the quantity produced. And here we go back to this idea that uh, when we talk about the production of goods, we're talking about the production of goods or services, okay? So it's, it's Q, but it's not quite Q that we know from the PQ model that we first talked about back in chapter three. This is quantity produced. And so this is internal to the firm. So we're gonna be using the term TP, total product, to, to reference those, for those uh, amounts produced. Because right now we're not really worried about the demand side. We will talk plenty about the demand side. Again, it never leaves our minds and nor should it, but right now we're gonna focus on the, the internals of the firm. So if we're talking about the totals, and we, and we, and we can talk about average product, I, I tend not to get into the discussion of average product here, other than the fact that the marginal drives all the averages. That's one of the things that I talked about last time with the example that I gave of the grade point average, which is one that I think most of us can relate to. That is the idea of how do you move your cumulative grade point average that goes all the way back to the first semester of the first grades ever recorded. Uh, well, you've got to cross over the average. You've got to cross over that cumulative in order to pull it up. And the, the further in the game, that is, the more observations there are, the more data points, in other words, the harder it becomes to do. And we will see examples of that very thing uh, here uh, as we go along. So we're talking about the marginals here. What are we talking about? We're talking about marginal product. Marginal product is this. And all marginals are basically the change in one thing divided by the change in another thing. So it's the total change in total product divided by the change in some input. And input I had written here, such as labor or L, and I'm just gonna simply use the labor input here. I think it's the easiest to understand. If anybody goes on to take a 300 level econ uh, micro course, you'll see inputs of labor and capital both running in the same picture. Capital goods being things like machinery, telephones and whatnot. I may use some of those examples here, but, but the, in terms of the, the actual examples that I'll do, they're using numbers, it'll be labor. I think that's the easiest to, to go with. So here we've got a Q. So this is why we don't use uh, Q for, for total product because we've got Q here being differentiated as an input, not as an output. So and again, we've got to be mindful of the fact that inputs affect outputs and outputs affect inputs, okay? So that's what marginal product is. And then this leads us then to <coughs> something called the production function. And I don't know if I, I can't see if I've got this up on the, the PowerPoint presentation. But there's something called the production function, which I'm not going to get into. I know your, your chapter in chapter seven does. It gives you a sample production function. And there are various production functions that have existed, uh, some of which are have been around for a very long time, but are so um, uh, relevant to even today's uh, production operations that they're still useful. And they, they often combine labor and capital together. Something called the Cobb-Douglas function is often uh, referred to in economic textbooks. We're not going to go there in this course because I don't think it's really germane to what we're trying to do just right, right just Okay, so what about this production function? What is the definition of a production function? Well, first of all, the term function should tell you that it's some sort of algebraic expression uh, or function or equation, and it is. It's not an expression, it's an equation. It basically is the mathematical representation, right? I'll go ahead and give you the definition here. <clears throat> it's the mathematical connection between inputs and outputs, right? So it's a mathematical relationship between inputs and outputs. And here we're talking about the inputs in terms of numbers usually and outputs numbers usually. You can extrapolate, put dollars into this once you know what the production function looks like. And, and once you know what the production function looks like, you can plug in numbers of inputs in relation to numbers of outputs. And, and, the, and, and hopefully what you end up with is a greater dollar value of outputs than a do, greater, greater dollar value of inputs. 
otherwise, what's the point? Uh, you know, if, if, you're, if it costs you more to produce something than what, it, what the value of that production is on the market, uh, that what the demand side is willing to pay for it, then you've got a problem <laughs> and then you're going to earn a loss. And that's generally not the objective, is it? So that's what a production function is. I talk about it only because that I want to be clear that there is a, a, a mathematical and a logical relationship between these, these two kind of values. But what about production? So rather than get into this idea of Q equals, Q is a function of labor capital and whatnot, which is how we typically represent a production function. So without getting into the, the tall weeds of the, the, the algebra here, let's just simply talk about the fact that there is a relationship between inputs and outputs. But the key fact that we want to know is, that we should know here is that it always results in diminishing marginal returns. Every known production function that is out there results in diminishing marginal returns. Now, there was a reason why we first started talking about diminishing returns uh, with regard to utility. And that was, I said at the time that it's gonna be the first of what we call a diminishing function. Utility is a diminishing function. We talked about that. That, if, that if, if we move outward on this quantity axis, that is away from the origin. So if we're increasing quantity, that is a good becomes less scarce. We don't tend to get as much value out of that good, right? If the Rolling Stones played here once every 10 years, we would get a lot of value and people would be willing to pay a lot for it. If the Rolling Stones played every single day in Isotopes Park, uh, I don't think we, I think we would get very tired. Not that they would, of course, but I think we would get very tired and people would not be willing to pay to go see that. So there's probably a reason why they don't do that, right? So you get the idea. It's, we get diminishing returns from that. So it's, it's, a, it's not only a consumption concept, it's a production concept. We get diminishing marginal returns. And what does that mean? It means we get diminishing marginal product. So the diminishing returns here are that of diminishing marginal product. And I will tell you what this is going to look like here and why that is the case. So diminishing marginal product is defined as the change in total product divided by this change in some input. So if we were to graph this and we've got quantity of, and let's, I, I, the input I'm going to use is labor, right? And, and I'm going to plot this against total product on this axis here. Well, here's what this looks like. This is what no, every new production function is said to represent. And that is this. You've got units of some input. In this case, we're just simply going to refer to labor. And we're going to mark little hash marks over here for incremental, that is marginal increases to uh, additions of labor. So what happens is, is this. As you employ uh, more labor, you're getting more actual, more productivity, more bang for the buck. But at some point, you're going to top out and you're going to experience diminishing marginal returns. This is what a marginal product function looks like. And whether or not this sort of fish hook is, is fat or skinny or whatever, and I know your book has sort of a longer range and, and a decline, it doesn't really make any difference. The point is you've got an increasing uh, function here that is a positive slope, an inflection point, and a negative slope here. And this negative slope really represents diminishing marginal product. That is, you're getting less and less uh, product as you produce more, as you add more input. And now, why is that the case? And we'll specifically take the case of labor, okay? And this is important to know. And I'm going to use a very simple example here um, to describe why this is the case that we're going to have diminishing marginal returns, but why we have this initial gains. Here we're talking about gains in productivity, which is why we have this initial slope. So let's say that, first of all, you're a one person for you're the owner, you're the operator, you're the chief bottle washer and, and everything. You, you do everything. What is your job? It's everything, right? You've got to answer the phone. You've got to go to the post office. You've got to write checks for bills. You've got to sweep the floor. Or you've got to stock inventory. You've got to do everything. And so if you have any kind of sales at all, you might say, hey, it might be good to add another worker to help me do things. And so you hire a worker to do things which are less critical, but are nonetheless have to be done. So that person then can sweep the floor and go to the post office and whatnot. And while you can wait on customers and answer the phone and do other things. And you find that's very productive. And so you get more bang for the buck because of that. Hey, it makes sense. And so I will hire another worker. So that other worker then could do the things like sweep the floor, you know, go to the post office, and the other worker can then pay, write the checks and pay the bills. And you can focus strictly on dealing with customers all day and dealing with sort of big picture items. But at some point, though, the productivity, the marginal productivity of adding more units of labor goes down and down. Because now if you add a third and a fourth and a fifth worker, 
what's happening? You're having an overlapping of duties and responsibilities where you literally get into the two people changing a light bulb type of, of thing, right? The old joke, right? Uh, or, you know, three people going to the post office. Uh, or just simple, one of the dynamics, organizational dynamics that, that business schools have talked about is the idea of people working in crowded workspaces oftentimes do a lot of talking back and forth and don't get as much done because of the fact that they're not all, all the time that well supervised. I can tell you that I worked in an office once, this was in banking, and we were always pretty busy, but it, we didn't always get off to a busy start in the day. Um, you know, we would roll in about eight o'clock and we'd have our coffee and we'd talk. And if it was a Monday morning, we would talk about football from the prior day. And then the rest of the staff would come in, they'd start talking and it'd be sort of 10 o'clock and uh, maybe we'd get to work and by 11, somebody would say, you wanna do an early lunch? And we'd go lunch and be back at 1230, realized the day was mostly half over and we had gotten really nothing done. It happens, but you can't happen with one person. You're not gonna to talk to yourself, right? Uh, it happens you've got more people involved. It is a dynamic, it is a thing, and it's something that is, is more common really in sort of crowded settings, office settings, than it is on, on in production settings. Uh, and I know that, that not all workplaces are like that. Um, you know, I know that, that my father-in-law was a construction superintendent and uh, was known to be almost a tyrant, really, and didn't like people talking, you know, uh, uh, while they were doing the work. He thought it took away from their job and that, you know, people would talk about things and then they'd make mistakes and they'd get busy talking about football the night before and whatnot. And they wouldn't pay attention and suddenly someone's got a nail through their foot and uh, from a, a, a nail. Or, so you get the idea. It's a lack of productivity. But it isn't just people. Before it sounds like I'm... I'm not a, a, a tear against people. It's also machinery because how many telephone lines do you need? Well, if you've only got, so and I'm going to depart from the labor examples, but just to talk about telephones, since I've already mentioned it, if you've got one telephone line, that's not very productive. If it's busy, then you're going to lose sales probably. Who's going to want to keep calling you back if your line is busy? Or if it goes to voicemail, that's not a very good sign. If you get a second line, somebody else can answer it. So you're not missing as many calls. Maybe a third line even makes sense. But how many lines is important before you've got you've got now 18 lines and you're not utilizing them, you're getting less and less productivity per phone line. So it's per phone line, per copier, per whatever um, vehicles. I know that uh, I worked at a company one time that had just all these vehicles and um, even the employees themselves who probably didn't really care that much thought, this is really inefficient having all these cars that we've got here. But it's an example, that would be an example of a capital input that is superfluous and is not particularly useful. So you've got this sort of diminishing function. So what happens is there is a connection then between uh, that and total product. And actually, let me put this over here, okay? And I'm going to go ahead and erase this, all right? So there is a connection between total product, and that, it, it looks something like this, that if we put the same product, uh, total product on this horizontal axis, on this vertical axis, and we've got the same quantity of labor. Well, now we're not going to model marginal product. We're simply going to marginal measure total product, which is going to do that's going to sort of tail off, right? So the total product will actually lose steam. It will lose slope. It will actually uh, become negative. But it's but it's total. Remember, total goes all the way back to the first unit. So it's not necessarily negative. It doesn't have a negative slope because you are adding you are adding uh, to total production, just not as quickly. Hence the loss in slope. Okay, so here's the thing to know about these things, and, and I think one of the, the things that, that trips people up sometimes about studying micro is that we're not always clear as to what we're talking about in terms of the denomination of it. And not only do we have three different kinds of values, totals, marginals, and averages, but we also need to know, are we talking about units, such as numbers? Yes, we're not talking about dollars, and we're not talking about dollars here, we're talking about numbers, and numbers, and numbers, okay? These are all numbers. So it's important to know what we're measuring. And, and, and we, frankly, can put lots of things together uh, with different things. But let's bring dollars into the picture here, okay? Let's bring dollars into the picture. And here we'll go back, we'll talk about total products, and we'll put a dollar figure on this axis here. And by the way, this is really not that much different, really, than a PQ plane that we've talked about before, right? You've got dollars on the vertical, ac on the vertical axis, quantities on numbers on this axis. And so uh, it's not really all that different. The only difference is we're not involved in the demand side. The demand side is not part of the picture. 
So what do we got going on here? Well, okay, if cost, remember the, the thing that we talked about with regard to cost, we said that inputs create cost, right? Inputs create cost, and it's, it's something I'm gonna to return to here in just a minute when we talk about fixed versus variable. If inputs create cost, then it must be the cost or reflection of, of these numerical inputs. And so if in fact we've got this kind of thing going on, where we've got an increase in productivity, then it must mean that we've got some sort of increase in productivity measured by some efficiency in terms of cost. So as we're being more productive, we're also uh, getting uh, incurring less cost per unit simply because of efficiencies as we are able to produce more output. And in fact, this is one reason why firms will want to hire workers, right? Why hire them at all? It's because you're more productive. I mean, a firm doesn't hire workers just to have workers typically. They hire them because it really creates overall productivity. One person can't do it all, right? And so as a result of this, you have a, an efficiency in dollar terms. But as diminishing returns set in, as they always do with every known production function, this begins to, to creep upward. And this is the marginal cost function, simply defined as the change in total cost divided by the change in total product. So the marginal product has this sort of fish hook uh, configuration. But it's almost like if you took the, the marginal product function and flipped it through the screen here, uh, flipped it through the board, and you have this mirror image uh, only in reverse, right? And in fact, one is a reflection of the other. In fact, the term reflection is a pretty good term to use, isn't it? The idea that one thing uh, mirrors the other in this particular context. So the marginal cost function has this particular configuration. We're going to be talking lots and lots and lots about marginal cost as we uh, continue on. And by the way, I think one, oh, you know, one formula I think I may have missed for you um, on that little cheat sheet I didn't think about at the time was marginal revenue. And marginal revenue, you might want to add this. Uh, I'm sorry that I missed this, was the change in total revenue divided by the change in total product. So, which is all we're going to do is substitute the word R, the letter R for C. Uh, but, but revenue is an input. So, revenue is an inflow representing the value of outputs, whereas Costs or outflows representing the value of inputs. Remember, <clears throat> what happens to numbers usually is reversed by the dollars. So if you're uh, increasing the number of inputs, you're going you're to increase the number of dollars, right? As you increase the number of workers, you're going to increase the number of dollars as you uh, as you increase that. So and the same goes with revenue. As you increase out outputs, goods leaving, you're going to have more revenue coming in. So you want to make sure that you have that particular thing added. I, I think I, I missed that. I think it seems to me that I omitted that and for, for reasons that I don't really know why. Okay. So if you look in your PowerPoint package here, you've got some examples of average cost. And I've got some of these written out for you, but not all of them are there. I've also got utility. Oh, I've got the marginal revenue function written out there. So, but I just put them all in one place for you. So you've kind of got all of those. And you've also got some examples of what some of the averages are. And uh, we're talking here about marginals. And then the final slide here uh, is marginal product, and it's a reflection of the production function. That is the mathematical relationship between inputs and outputs. And, uh, and what you've got, and, they're, they're, and I said value, and I probably should not have said value, I should have said the number of inputs and the number of outputs, but, it, but I said that it's a diminishing function, and it is. The idea of the more we put into something, the less we get it incrementally. And again, a diminishing function is what was the first so, uh, sort of example that I used when I talked about diminishing functions. And that was the idea that, you know, if you go to the gym, you work out for an hour, right? You get lots and lots of benefit from it, usually. But if you spend another hour, you get less and less benefit from it. Spend another hour, at the same time, you're getting less and less incremental benefit to the point where your benefit is actually probably negative if you're there for 10 hours. Enough is enough uh, of doing enough of, of anything, right? You get diminishing returns from that. It's just like, uh, you know, if you uh, are, think you have broken something, you get an x-ray and then you get another x-ray and you keep getting x-rays. It's like, you're not really gonna get that much more value from adding additional x-rays. In fact, you might do some damage. Okay, so questions for me. I think I've lost a couple of uh, people. People have kind of leave and get knocked off and come back. So uh, I, I will continue on here. And let's talk a bit about what some examples are of these particular functions. And I've got some examples that I have drawn up that are, I hope are actually a little bit more straightforward than, uh, than what we see in, some, in the textbook. I think textbooks do have a tendency to probably give more information than what is sometimes necessary. 
Uh, and I think that that is just the nature of the beast, but I'll try to make this a little bit more apprehensible. First, let's talk about total product, okay? And, and margin product. And, and I want to talk about the relationship between the two. So remember, we're talking about the production function. So we're talking about inputs. So quantity of labor would be an input. Total product would be a, an, an output. So input, output, and then the marginal difference between those. The marginal product again defined as the change in total product divided by the change in the input, which in this case is labor. Okay. And let's say we've got different combinations of labor inputs. We've got zero, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. No workers, one worker, two workers, three workers, four workers, five workers, over whatever period of time is the relevant period of measure, a day, a week, whatever. Okay. So with zero workers, we're going to expect to have zero units of of output, and so as a result, we're going to get zero there. Uh, if we add one worker, we're going to, let's say, hypothetically add four units of output. So what is the difference between those, between uh, zero and four is four. And again, we usually put marginal values at a half step between these, because it's as we go from zero to one worker. We could put it on here as we land on the one worker, but it's usually sort of presented at the half step. And by the way, it's the change in total product, that is, four minus zero over one minus zero, well, that's four, right? So that's a pretty easy uh, calculation. In fact, the math is exceptionally easy for the denominator because it's only gonna change by one every time. So let's say that we add, and let, let me just finish up the total product column. Two workers gives us 10 units of output, three workers, 13 units, four workers, 15, and five workers, 16 units. And so we really don't even need to compute the denominator because it's gonna be, uh, as we go from one to two workers, it's gonna be, 10 minus four over two minus one. It's always gonna be one, so 10 minus four is six. So here we've got what? We've got a, an increase in overall productivity as we add labor. That is, now we've got a division of labor. And a division of labor, if you go back to the very early stages of your textbook, you will know that it talks about the idea that we get better productivity as we divide up the work. And that's where we get some of these economies here, uh, that is efficiencies through division of labor. But it's going to be short-lived as we add more workers because as we go from 10 to 13, we now have three. That's 13 minus 10 divided by three minus one, which is three, and then two and one. So the math is relatively easy. So here we've got this initial bump upward and then a decline downward. This is where the diminishing marginal returns set in. So a lot of us have heard the term diminishing returns before. And uh, in economics, we would simply refer to that as diminishing marginal returns. It's really saying the same thing, means the same thing, but it's just sort of modifying that to, to, to not talking about diminishing total returns, because then I erase the graph, but total returns are still rising. And in fact, total production is still rising. It's just incrementally rising less and less. By the way, this is one reason why firms will occasionally lay workers off. It's because there's a recognition of the production function and what marginal product can do. Uh, particularly if the uh, yeah if maybe the total level of output is is not sufficient maybe the, the the price that they're getting for the particular output is not satisfactory uh, by reducing the amount of workers then you actually move up the productivity scale and you and you get uh, greater marginal productivity and lower cost per unit as you do so so sometimes this, this whole idea of right sizing or reduction in force or whatever you whatever these sort of benign terms, benign sounding terms are, they all are seeking to get the same thing going. That is the idea of trying to create efficiencies. And so you know, in, in macro, we talk about unemployment as being not necessarily a function of a lousy economy. It could simply be that even if we're making huge money, will occasionally lay workers off or move them around or do something different, redeploy them, but take them out of some particular activity because they're trying to get better efficiencies because maybe there are too many people employed in that particular kind of thing. Maybe what they're producing is something that's, uh, you know, an older generation of a product that still has got a demand side for it, but the demand is shrinking all the time. Uh, and you have to wonder, you know, what the future of it's going to be, you know. And so as a result, you have to wonder how productive it's going to get, okay? All right, so that's a discussion of the, the marginals here. Uh, I want to talk a bit more about some of these. I, I gave you some of the definitions that you want to know. But those, those are not uh, the only definitions you will want to know about uh, here in our particular discussion, because there are others as well. 
And so let's talk a bit about, um, because I gave you average variable cost, average fixed cost, but didn't really talk about what they are. So let's talk about them now, okay? So I want to uh, go back to this very basic model that I've talked about before. And I know that uh, it sounds like I'm getting very, very basic here, but I am. We're talking about the economics of the firm. We're talking about the production process, whether it's a good or a service, and we're talking about outputs. And what is it that we need to know about inputs? Inputs uh, create costs. And they represent outflows. Outputs create revenues. Revenues are inflows. And so we've got a difference between inflows and outflows. So inputs create costs, out outputs create revenues. But let's tear into this a little bit and talk about two different kinds of inputs, right? That if in fact you've got different kinds of inputs, let's talk about the idea that if we've got fixed inputs, and variable inputs, what they do. Well, fixed inputs create fixed costs. And variable inputs create variable costs. Oops. Variable inputs create variable costs. Okay, let's talk about what these are, first of all. So fixed inputs, if, if we've got two kinds of inputs generically, fixed inputs and variable inputs, what's a fixed input? We define a fixed input as, a, as an input which is not going to move in nature. It's, it's largely consisting of something like a capital input, like machinery, a plant, an office building, uh, a piece of machinery, a vehicle. These are not things that are going to change with the level of production. If the plant closes for two weeks over the holidays, Christmas and New Year's, uh, those inputs aren't going anywhere. The, the, the variable inputs, such as labor, might go away for those two weeks. Uh, but those fixed inputs aren't going in there. They're fixed. And because they, they create fixed costs. And if you think about what the fixed costs are, the definition of a fixed cost is it does not vary with the level of production. Okay? It does not vary with the change in total product. They do not vary. So as a result, if you are paying a mortgage on a building that is being shut down for two weeks over the Christmas holiday, that mortgage doesn't stop you still incur the cost of the interest expense and the taxes and the insurance and all those kinds of things, which are fixed because they don't vary with the level of, of output. Likewise, the insurance on the vehicles and whatnot don't change. So they don't vary with the change in total product. That is, they don't vary with the level of activity. So some examples are of these are things like the interest expense, right? An interest expense uh, obviously can change over time particularly as a loan amortizes that is it's, it's paid down. But in the very short run, and we're going to be differentiating short and long run, uh, just kind of bear with me that we're talking about the short run here, uh, that it won't vary very much. Interest expense, lease expense. That is, uh, even if your firm is shut down for a year because of COVID, well, the lease continues, right? And a lot of business owners have found that there was not much relief. While there might have been relief for some uh, uh, renters, uh, some some household renters, uh, there wasn't often that much uh, relief, uh, except for certain industries. The restaurant industry was one example. Restaurants, bars, those those kinds of things. So lease expense would continue. Also, things like insurance costs You've got nothing to do in the short run with the level of production. Okay, and then one big one here is salaries. Now, obviously, what differentiates the salary from an hourly wage is that it is fixed, right? That is, if you are paying, and, and, and who earns salaries within an organization? It's a personnel expense, right? It's a personnel expense, and uh, personnel expense usually includes wages and benefits, and insurance is a big issue, is a big part of that. Okay, and that's usually fixed, even if it's a variable wage worker. Okay, so that part is still under the fixed category, but salaries differ from hourly wages in the sense that they're fixed. And so as a result, if a salary employee goes on vacation, that worker is usually compensated for that time off. And it's given, it's usually agreed upon that they get X number of weeks off, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever per year. Sometimes hourly workers take a vacation and do not get paid. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Depends on what the particular agreement is, uh, the arrangement is with the firm. Uh, sometimes a, a worker who uh, is salaried uh, calls in sick and has got a, a lot of number of sick days, or in some cases, I would say probably most salary workers don't have an allotted number of sick days. Um, I, 
I, most of the salary jobs that I had, I don't know that there was an, an actual number of sick days that you could have. But I know we do at CNO, but our range was a little bit different because we've got a collective bargaining agreement and this was sort of built into it. And I think I've used one sick day in 16 years. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just not used to taking sick days. And you know, my experience as a salary worker was, uh, you know, that we didn't really have sick days. And so uh, if we missed work, we didn't have to make, up, make it all up anyway. So, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So, but the point is from a dollar standpoint, it's fixed. It doesn't have to do with the level of production. In the long run, yes, it will change because people's salaries tend to go up and insurance costs tend to go up. But in the short run, these are fixed in nature because they represent fixed inputs, just like managers are relatively fixed. You can't say, I, I've got a manager and I want uh, another half a manager. And so I'm going to go from one to 1.5 managers. It doesn't really work that way. Or even the idea that I've got a manager and I want to hire another manager just for a week and then I'll let him go. I mean, nobody's going to take a job as a manager for one week. Usually, I don't, I don't think, right? So you kind of get the idea that these are fixed in nature. What about variable inputs? Variable inputs create variable cost, and that the difference is, well, simply put, they do vary with a change in total product. Okay, and so what are some examples of these? Well, I've already talked about some examples, but things like things which are most obvious, things like materials, which vary directly, and I don't, and a lot of times these vary directly. That is, they go in the same direction as the change in the total product. They go up and down with the level of production. So materials. That are used uh, in in the uh, amount of production. Everything which can be considered an inventoryable cost, you know, sometimes including labor itself, sometimes including overhead, uh, sometimes including things like electricity. So sometimes utilities are included in that. Uh, overhead in general, what we call variable overhead. Overhead itself, uh, for those of you who take the managerial accounting or even further cost accounting, overhead is a kind of a complicated subject. There is an element of overhead known as fixed overhead, and there's no known as variable overhead, particularly when it comes to things like electricity that is usually divided between a fixed and variable element. Uh, I don't want to get too deeply in the woods because it doesn't really make that much difference for what we're doing. I just want you to, to be aware that there is that particular complication. Utilities, we're just going to simply focus on the fact that as you produce more, you're probably going to have more workers. We're going to have the lights on. They're going to run the air conditioning and, the, and or the heat, and use more water as they, you know, wash their hands and go to the bathroom and whatnot. So the more work, the more work, the more utilities are going to be used and vice versa as we dial down in the other direction, right? So utilities were an example of this. And then the big one would be hourly wages. Hourly wages. So this obviously, uh, this is what differentiates. And, I, and I, I specifically focus on these labor costs, not only because labor is the input that I'm using as the example here, but also because for a lot of firms, wages are the major expense. In fact, I would say most firms probably wages expense, that is what we usually sort of lump all together is what we call personnel expense, is the biggest expense. But it's not every, uh, not every industry that's like that. And I would imagine in some high tech settings where some of the materials are extremely expensive. So as a result, that might be the biggest expense, even in some parts of healthcare and healthcare. And, and, and medical products, I, I can imagine that the, the, the big personal expense is not the major expense. I know I came out of the banking world where the, the bigger expense was, <clears throat> was interest expense, but it wasn't an interest ex expense that, that we paid to borrowers, it's what we paid to depositors, and that was the big expense, bigger even than what we paid workers, but we're talking about billions and billions of dollars of deposits and a couple thousand workers. So, you know, you, you get the idea, but the, the point is though, that personal expense is a big expense and it does vary. So hourly wages will fluctuate with the amount of work that's being done, in particular things like overtime, right? Because there are plenty of hourly workers out there who make a fixed wage per hour whose hours are relatively fixed. They may work 40 hours per week, right? But make $18 per hour. And so as a result, they, they're almost like a salaried worker, but they're they're but what, what differentiates them is the fact that they can earn overtime. Whereas salary workers, that concept does not exist. This is really sort of the dark side of salaries is the fact that uh, particularly as you start early in your career, uh, almost whatever the career is as a profession, uh, you're going to be working probably a lot of overtime and you're not going to, or, and you're not going to be paid overtime because you're going to be on a salary. Uh, and, and this is the story with almost every profession because who earns salaries in the first place? 
it's management and professional staff. And that's really it uh, within, within organizations, usually, right? And let's not even get into big league athletes, and, you know, NBA stars and all that. That's a different, they're more independent contractors than they do, they really. They really are. They sign their own agreements that are unique to them and whatnot. But salaries are, are fixed expenses. So in, in almost every occupation, whether it's uh, medical residents right out of medical school, uh, people right out of, grad, uh, out of law school who become law clerks before they practice, hours and hours and hours, 50, 60, 70 hours a week for the same uh, amount of pay. It is the, the way of the, of the world. Accountants, uh, I know my, my academic advisor when I was in graduate school thought he was really a, a big shot having passed the CPA exam, gone to work for Price Waterhouse. And uh, the first week he was sent down to the basement to put stamps on envelopes where he did that for about 50 hours that first week and thought, wow, this is pretty demeaning. But and he was paid no more to do it, uh, but you get the idea. They wanted it done because it had to be done, and you can pretty much do whatever you want with a salaried employee. And I'm not trying to, you know, launch into a diatribe on salaries. I'm just trying to simply say what they are and why they are fixed, because there's a reason why they're fixed. Now, the, the upside of that is the fact that the, the highest paid people in every organization tend to receive some sort of salary. Okay, and those salaries oftentimes exceed those earned by hourly wage workers, okay? So there is that difference. The point is though, they vary with uh, the level of production, okay? Or they don't vary with the level of production in the case of fixed costs. So if, input, if fixed inputs create fixed costs, then variable inputs create variable costs. And so uh, fixed costs simply look like that, variable costs look like that. So when we talk about these kinds of things, what are the averages here that we should know about? Well, I've given some of these values uh, before, but let's talk about what they are. Uh, and they're in your slide pack, <coughs> package or whatnot. Remember, we've got two kinds of values in economics. We've got uh, totals, marginals, and averages, right? So what are we really talking about here? So if we're talking about total fixed costs, we're talking about FC, that's the total. That's the totals, right? And variable costs. If we're talking about averages, we're talking about average fixed cost defined as fixed cost over total product and average variable cost, which is defined as variable cost over total product. And then the marginals here are simply, uh, well, there is no, no really, it doesn't, isn't really defined because it's not gonna change here, but it's, it's the average variable cost really is the same as the marginal cost. It's the change in total cost divided by the change in total product. That's in fact, that is almost always what that is. Even though it's total cost, which includes fixed costs, uh, it's really the variable cost element. And then as to total cost itself, total cost is simply if, if fixed, if all inputs are created in two subsets, fixed and variable inputs, then all costs are created in two subsets, fixed cost plus variable cost. And if in fact, average total cost is composed of average fixed cost plus average variable cost, plus a big, uh, Variable cost over the total product. Then what is that? What is um, uh, average fixed cost over? It is, is simply you can simply get rid of these and simply. Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's fixed cost over total product and variable and variable cost over total product. Then what you're really saying is the average total cost is average fixed cost plus average variable cost. Sorry about it. You get so close to the board. It's sometimes kind of hard to see what you're doing there. So average total cost is average fixed cost plus average variable cost. Okay, so there's a lot going on here, but I hopefully this becomes clear once we do an example, and that's the thing I want to do next is to do an example, and I've still got some time to do this, and uh, I'm pretty much where I thought I would be. So I'm going to uh, pick up and uh, basically use the same example I used before, but I'm going to go ahead here, and uh, uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase the marginal product uh, column here. I'll probably bring that back, but I, I just want to use the same basic construction so that way we can sort of add on to it. And if you want to, you know, if you want to uh, go back and if you have room to add on, you can, or otherwise you can recreate this column, or you can just look at what I'm doing here and just sort of follow along. So we've got quantity of labor, that's the input, total product, which is the quantity of output. So again, the production function is the mathematical relationship between the quantity of inputs. And the quantity of outputs, in this case, the only input we're talking about is the labor input. 
So let's take a scenario here where let's say that the if in fact fixed costs equals $25, right? Right. And the variable cost, which is simply labor, is uh, $25 per person per day. Okay. $25 per person per day. That's the scenario. Okay. So then let's, then what do we got going here? We will have a call for fixed cost. We'll have a call for variable cost, and we'll have a call for total cost. Remember, total cost is equivalent to fixed cost plus variable cost. And I'll bring you the variables here in just a second. But let's go ahead and figure out what we're doing here. Well, fixed costs do not vary with the level of production. So even at zero units of production, the firm is shut down. You're still going to incur the same fixed cost of 25. And by the way, in the short run, which we're assuming is the case, it's going to be 25 all the way down because isn't that the definition of what fixed costs are? They do not vary with the level of production. Okay. All right. Well, in a variable cost is $25 per day. And this is per day, right? So, uh, so I, I probably should say fixed cost of $25 per day as well, right? $25 per day. So variable cost, if you're hiring no workers, then you're going to incur no variable cost if that's your only variable input. We're assuming that it is. Just labor. That's not including any other uh, amounts of labor. You've got one worker. It's twenty-five dollars for that worker, so it's one. Two workers is two times twenty-five is fifty. Two times three is seventy-five. Again, the math is not intended to be difficult. It's intended to be straightforward. So as a result, it simply goes up by twenty-five as you add one worker. Assuming every worker is paid the same wage, and that's not all that unrealistic of a scenario, even though there are some differences. Uh, between workers based upon seniority and uh, and maybe responsibility and whatnot. Uh, within a work unit, it's the wages don't vary enough to be usually that different. There are exceptions. Yes, I know that there are exceptions, particularly people with vast amounts of seniority and whatnot. Okay. So if total cost is the combination of fixed and variable cost, then it's simply column three plus column four equals column five, right? So fixed cost plus variable cost. 25 plus zero is 25. 25 plus 25 is 50. 25 plus 50 is 75. 100, 125, and 150. Again, I'm not trying to, uh, I'm trying to make the math as, as straightforward as I can, just so that, that we can sort of understand uh, really what is, is going on here, okay? So again, the math does not need to be complicated. And yes, in real life, you're probably gonna have uh, you know, uh, pennies and, and fractions of, of dollars and whatnot. And that's fine. We, sometimes we round them, sometimes we don't, you know. And so it depends on how you say it. And, and a lot of times these are done by spreadsheet. I get that. But a lot of what we do in these college courses is we do a lot of things by hand so that we understand what the, the background is so that we can do them on computer at some point to save time. But if we don't know what's going on uh, with, with the background of this, then uh, we're sort of lost. But there's no, in my mind, there's no point in, you know, making people suffer through endlessly complicated com uh, computations when it doesn't need to be that case, okay? So that's an example. What does this look like graphically, okay? And you're going to see some examples of this. And these are just the totals, not the, uh, uh, you know, not the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, not the, the marginals or the averages, okay? So what do we got going on here, right? So we've got a fixed cost function, which, Looks like that, right? It's simply a straight line. At every level of production, zero, one, uh, zero, four, 10, 13, 15, 16, uh, we're gonna have the same dollar figure, which is $25, right? So it's gonna be the same regardless. But variable cost actually starts the origin because we have zero cost and it will go up. And so variable cost looks like that, right? And I don't know that I do this necessarily to scale because fixed and variable costs will actually equal each other at one unit. So maybe I should have Drawn is more like that, I guess, uh, you know, that sort of thing. But you kind of get the idea here. Uh, uh, but let's just for the sake of accuracy, I guess I will. Maybe I'll do this. I think that might be easier if I simply take this and put one unit at a little bit further distance, just so it's a little easier to see. I think that might be easiest for all of us if we do that. So let's do that. Let's have this and where we have now our fixed cost, which is 25. And then we'll have one, two, three, uh, or whatever they even, actually it's at four units of output, and this is total product here. 
to four and 10 and 13 and whatever. And so it will actually start at zero and it will intersect fixed cost and variable cost will intersect at that unit. So it's going to go like that, right? Okay, and that's all I really want to do there is to sort of explain the fact that variable cost is upward sloping, really more curvilinear than it is uh, linear in nature, but you kind of get the idea as to what's, what's going on. There. Okay, all right. So there is that particular example. Now, what I want to do is this. So we talked a bit about totals. We talked a little bit about marginals. We haven't really gotten into that much of the averages yet, certainly not in terms of uh, bringing these forward in terms of, of adding to them. So why don't we do that now? Let's just simply add to this particular spreadsheet that we've got here. What we've got now, quantity of input. We've got total product. We've got fixed cost, variable cost, total cost. Well, then what's the next area where we want to go in order to sort of bring all of this together, all of these particular units, with the exception of revenue. And I gave you the revenue, but it was sort of an afterthought, frankly, because we're not really talking about the demand side yet. We're talking mostly about the supply side, the economics of the firm. And But we will talk plenty, and I'm, I assure you we'll talk plenty about revenue, marginal revenue, as it relates to marginal cost as we get going here. So, all right, well, what's next that we want to talk about here? And that is marginal cost. Marginal cost defined as the change in total cost divided by the change in total product. So marginal cost would be the next category that we want to compute. And so we'll do that, right? And what's next is average fixed cost defined as fixed cost over total product, average variable cost, which is uh, variable cost over total product, and average total cost, which really has two different, oops, which really has two different means of computing it. Average total cost is both AFC plus ABC, plus it's also total, total cost over quantity, or, or over total product, right? Which is the same thing. It's the same as ATC plus ABC, or it's total cost over total product. It's the same because one is a derivation of the other. So nothing really particularly different as far as that goes. Okay. All right. And I don't have much room. Let's see how much. Uh, I can sort of expand this a little bit here because I may want to just show just a, just a little bit here if I could yeah, uh, sort of bring in some of the computations and I will zoom back in. Particularly, I realize we're losing a bit of, of sharpness here on this board, but I'm going to, particularly for marginal cost, and then I'll kind of zoom back in. But I want to uh, make sure that we're, we're capturing what the changes are. Now, we're talking about the change in total cost divided by change in total product. Now, remember, every time in economics and pretty much everywhere else where the Greek uh, delta symbol is used, it's new minus old. And that is the change in total cost is simply total cost, uh, uh, say one minus total cost zero over the change in total product, which is total product one minus total product zero, that sort of thing. And so let's just simply go with, with this particular example. So marginal cost that is as we go from zero to one units of labor, zero to four units of production and 25 to 50 uh, dollar uh, amounts of dollar. That is, what is the cost us per unit to create uh, those four units, right? So what is the, the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity? And there's a reason why I zoomed out just, I hope we're capturing this. I'm trying to see here whether or not we are truly getting this. Uh, let me maybe zoom out just a bit more here and I apologize uh, for that, but I will zoom back in. So what do we got going here? Change in total cost, right, is uh, between zero and one units of, of input is 50 minus 25, right? That's total cost over four minus zero. So the math on the denominator is easy. 50 minus 25 is 25 over four, which is 6.25. So 6.25 is the marginal cost as we go from zero to one units of input and zero to four units of output. And marginal cost, as the term implies, is a dollar figure. As we go from one to two units of output, what do we got? The cost goes from 75, 50 to 75, and from 10 to four. So it's 75 minus 50 is 25, 10 minus four is six, and that equals 4.166666 or 4.17. So that is the change in margin. Now notice it's going down, right? Let's go from two to three units of input and, uh, 10 to 13 units of output, and the change in total cost is 100 and from 75. So 100 
minus 75 over 13 minus 10, that's 25 over three, which is 8.33, 8.33. Now notice what's going on here. This is the configuration that we expected, isn't it? We expect it to go down as we add additional inputs, that is we get the benefits of division of labor, we get efficiencies from that, and the efficiencies in output translate to efficiencies in cost. So we get less unit cost, and but it will go up over time as diminishing marginal returns set in. And so we would expect marginal cost to go up from here, and that's what's going to be the case. And so now as we go from three to four units of output of input, we get uh, we a change in, in output from 15 to 13. So it's 125 over 100, minus 100, which is the cost element. 15 minus 13, so it's 25 over 2, which is 12.5. So 12.5, so it's again, marginal cost is going up. That's $12.50. Remember, these are dollar figures. And the final one is 150 minus 125 over 16 minus 15. So that's going to be one, so that cancels, and it's simply going to be 25. Okay, so that is the marginal cost value, fairly straightforward. That is marginal cost. It's, I mean, it's a bit more complicated, but that's as complicated as really as the math gets here. Even average total cost, which has got two different means of calculating, it's gonna be the same value every single time. Okay, so again, in the marginal cost value, we simply, we usually put at the half step between incremental uh, uh, columns here or, or rows because it's really being incurred as you go from one unit of, of input to the next unit and then create additional uh, incremental changes in outputs. But let's take the, uh, but let's assume that we're going to go with the original columns here and collect the rest of these figures here. We shouldn't really take that long. Uh, and we should be able to do it. So average fixed cost is simply fixed cost over total product. In other words, it's going to be $25 divided by every value in the, in the column. So it's going to be column three divided by column one for every row all the way down, okay? So it's 25 divided by zero is undefined. There is, it's illogical to divide uh, anything by zero. 25 divided by uh, four, however, is 6.25, which by the way is the same as the marginal cost there. So you have an intersection uh, point. Uh, 25 divided by uh, 13 is, let me see here, or 12 and a half, I guess, is what it is, is uh, 2.5, right? 2.5, 1.92, 1.67, and 1.56. That's simply column three divided by column two all the way down, right? So six and a quarter, uh, two and a half, 1.92, all the way down, right? Notice what goes on average fixed cost. It goes down over time, and it will because the numerator is fixed and the denominator goes up, which means that this value is going to go down, 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 down. And that is the beauty of fixed costs, and that is called spreading out fixed cost over more units of output. And this is going to lead us to one of the really big, important microeconomic concepts of all time. That is something called economies of scale. And that is as you increase your scale of production, it costs you less and less to do whatever it is you're doing, notably because the fixed cost element just becomes so small in relation to the, the value that the output you're producing. Much more on that a bit later, okay? Average variable cost is simply variable cost uh, divided by total, uh, uh, by total cost all the way down, right? Well, you know what? Um, let me see. Yeah, by total, by total product. I'm sorry, variable cost divided by total product. So it's, in other words, it's column four divided by column two all the way down, it's undefined for the first level. It's gonna be the same here because uh, you've got the same uh, element just coincidentally fixed in variable cost. So the average variable cost is gonna be 6.25. It's gonna be uh, five. That is uh, where you've got 50 uh, uh, now, uh, divided by uh, total product, right? So uh, is, is this right here, for variable cost? Average? It's five, 5.77. 6.67, Variable cost divided by total product. 6.25, 5, 5.77, 6, 6.65, 125 by 16 is 7.81. So you're gonna get the sense involved in that, okay? And that's all you're doing is simply taking column four, 
uh, divided by column two all the way down. Okay. And then the final one, you can compute two ways. You can simply add up these two columns or take total cost. You take column five divided by column two and insert that value or simply add up these two columns here, which is probably the easiest thing to do. And so as a result, at one unit of input, we're going to have 1250. Or, and you can do the math, it's again relatively straightforward 769, 833, and 938, which you can compute two ways. One, just simply adding up these two columns here to get this, or by taking total cost, column five divided by column two. It's going to be the same value because one is the derivation of the other. Now, one final thing I'll leave you here, and it's going to be a, a good jumping off point from where we go on Tuesday. And, uh, and I'll try to get into a little bit of uh, the discussion of the long run. And that's the idea of this, that just like marginal cost, where it kind of goes down and then it goes back up, the same goes with uh, average variable cost and average total cost, not average fixed cost. And the reason why is because it just goes down because it's independent of the level of output. Remember, marginal cost is changing, is taking, is tracking the incremental change in cost as we produce more output. Well, fixed costs have got nothing to do with it. They're fixed. The very notion of fixed cost is that they're independent of the level of output. So it doesn't make any difference. But the average variable cost is, and because average total cost is a, is simply contains the average variable cost element, it also does the same. That is, it goes down, then it goes up. So it reaches a bottom point, and then it goes up at around two units of input or uh, 10 units of output. It goes down, and then it goes back up. So it's going to have a similar sort of configuration. We sort of call it a cut configuration. It goes down and then it goes up. And that's where we'll pick it up on Monday. And, uh, and it'll, it'll be really the last thing we talk about with regard to cost. Uh, and I think what I'll probably do is sort of uh, uh, take the long run picture out of it. I probably won't get into that uh, on Tuesday. Just I'd rather spend more time in talking about, or on Monday, I mean, on Monday, uh, that more time talking about what we're trying to do here with regard to these particular uh, sorts of short-term elements. It's probably the best. Let me kind of zoom back in here just a bit so you can sort of freeze the video so you get a better view of what we are doing there. Um, and you can sort of capture that. You can pause the video or whatever. And, but make sure, and make, make sure my numbers are right. I mean, I, I did, it was fairly late at night when I did this, but uh, I think they are. And I mean, the key thing that I'll get to, which is a good jumping off point, is this notion of the marginal driving the average. And the marginal goes down and it comes back up and it drives the average, not fixed cost, not average fixed cost, but average variable cost. And because average total cost includes average variable cost, it also drives that as well. Just like the marginal performance in GPA drives the overall cumulative GPA, which goes all the way back to the first uh, grades being recorded, these average total costs and average variable costs go all the way back to the first units being produced. So it's a cumulative figure. It's a cumulative figure. Okay. All right. Well, if anybody has any questions for me, now's a good time. Uh, otherwise, I'm available all weekend. And I will pick it up with uh, this discussion by doing the graphs. It's one thing to see it in a sort of a spreadsheet uh, configuration, sort of my manual spreadsheet. I will put this in a graph and, uh, and show you what that looks like so that you can better see the interplay between marginal cost, average variable cost, and average total cost. And I will mostly do it for chapter seven. The only part I'm going to sort of leave off and sort of push to the next segment is going to be this long run picture, which brings us back to the idea of this economies of scale. But we'll get to that. That won't be a part of the exam uh, next week. Uh, in fact, it doesn't make any difference that we're pushing it forward because that will be a theme or at least a couple of the uh, items that we'll be talking about in the third segment of the class. That is that which precedes the third exam. But right now, let's focus on this exam coming up and we'll wrap up chapter seven on Tuesday. And I'm sorry, on Monday, I'm saying Tuesday. It's gonna be on Monday, it'll be Monday. And, uh, and then the exam will be available Wednesday. Again, I'll have an open uh, YouTube session uh, or an open Zoom uh, link available during the day of the test. So if you have any last minute questions, it's your time, you've got an hour, 15 minutes. You can ask me anything you want. I'll do problems for you, I'll work math problems. I'll do anything you'd like me to do so that you uh, feel more comfortable with the material, okay? All right, have a great weekend. I will see you next time.